So uh, yeah, my name is Ian Bouchard, and today we're going to talk about abusing PHP 7's opcache to spawn web shells. Now, before we begin, a little bit about myself. Um, like most of you here, I am a security enthusiast. I've started studying in security, I'd say, maybe a year ago or so. And uh, I've been doing capture flags uh, pretty much every week to practice and learn. Uh, I'm also a freshman at the Laval University. Some of you might know me or have seen me before. And I'm also a pen tester on the side for SecCore. Um, in the past, I've had the chance to work with the research and development team at GoSecure. Uh, GoSecure is one of the main reasons why I'm here in front of you today. Um, uh, most of the content that you're going to see here is based on the work that I did over there. And uh, they gave me the suggestion to do a talk here. So huge thanks to them and uh, huge thanks to uh, Hackfest too. So with that said, let's begin. So what is Opcache? Uh, has anyone here ever used or heard of Opcache before? Show of hands. OK, so a couple of people, great. Well, for those of you who don't know what Opcache is, um, Opcache is a new caching engine that comes with PHP 7. Uh, the goal of the caching engine is to uh, speed up your execution of your PHP scripts by up to 10, per, 10 times what you would normally get without it. And they do this by skipping some steps in the compilation process of a PHP script. So um, let's say you have a PHP, a PHP script that you'd like to run, um, whether it's through the command line or through a website where you visit a web page. What PHP is going to do is going to, um, let's see here, it's going to read your PHP script and break it down into tokens. These tokens will then get compiled into bytecode, and the bytecode gets executed. Now, the thing with that is that every time someone would visit your web page, that would re-trigger PHP to redo that same three-step process over and over again, which is pretty redundant. And that is the problem that PHP Opcache is trying to solve here. So like I said, there are some of the steps in the PHP process that are redundant. And what Opcache does to solve this is that they basically remove the uh, useless uh, process in, in the compilation steps. So, Let's say you have a website that you'd like to run. The very first time that a guest is going to visit one of your web pages, it's going to go through the normal process. So you're going to, the PHP is going to start off by breaking it down into tokens. The tokens will then get compiled into bytecode, and the bytecode gets executed. But this time, the bytecode is also stored in a cache. So this cache would be either in memory or in a file system cache. Now, the second time a guest is going to visit your web page, PHP is going to see that there's already the bytecode that's cached in, whether it's in memory or in the file system. And instead of going through the first two steps, it's just going to read from that cache directly and execute it. So your three-step process becomes a two-step process, and that's where you get your performance gains uh, out of the opcache from. Now, for this presentation, we're not going to look at uh, memory caching. We're just going to look at the file caching part. So to enable file caching, uh, what you'd have to do, you have to go to your php.ini file and enable it. Um, you do so, you have to specify a PHP, uh, you have to specify a folder where you want your file cache, uh, your cache files to be in. So in the example that we have at the top here, um, we're storing our file cache in slash temp slash opcache. So again, if you have a PHP, uh, PHP application that you'd like to run, and let's say your application is in slash var, triple w, html, and you have your three scripts there that are index, info, and about. Um, after the whole caching process, these, uh, the cache files will be in slash temp slash opcache, which is what we uh, defined at the top there, followed by a string, which is a system ID. We'll take a look at that one later. And then you have basically a mirror of the original source code tab, which is slash var, triple w, html, and then you have your uh, cache files underneath there. Now, these cache files, uh, if you look at the extension, it's .php.bin files. That's uh, the extension that's used by opcache for cache files. Now, this is mainly what we have to know about, about opcache to spawn the web shells at this point. Um, so, yeah, at this point, how do we do to spawn the web, uh, web shells out of this? Sorry, there are two more things that we have to know. First off, those php.bin files that we mentioned earlier, they are basically copies of your original source code. Uh, they're just compiled versions that are put into cache. So they're basically uh, the same content at this point. The other thing we have to know is that the cache files and folders that I mentioned earlier, the slash temp opcache, um, and all of those subfolders, they have to be writable by your user running your web service. 
at some point in your application, if you add new PHP files uh, to your app, you'll, your PHP app will want to cache them into the cache folder. And if they're not writable, well, obviously they won't be cached. So you have to, they have to remain uh, writable by that uh, user. Usually it's gonna be a triple W data or something like that. So knowing this, what would happen if we managed to gain write access to one of those cache files, uh, cache folders? Or more specifically, what would happen if we managed to overwrite one of those cache files with malicious content? Basically, what would happen? Um, PHP is going to look into the is going to try to execute a script. It's going to look in the file cache and see that there's already a, a cache a cache file that's available. This time, that cache file is actually a malicious file, and um, PHP is just going to execute that directly, completely bypassing the original source code. And that's the basis on uh, how do we abuse op caches on web shells. We're going to inject in mal malicious cache files. Now, before we were able to do this, there are some technicalities that we have to take care of for, uh, first. Um, so what you're seeing here right now is the file structure for a php.bin file. So all of the cache files will have this structure. Um, it starts off with eight bytes of magic, which is the signature of the file. Usually it's gonna be op cache with a null byte at the end. After that, you have a system ID of 32 bytes. We'll look into that later. And then you have a uh, memory size, string size, timestamp, which are just meta infos, and the data that you see at the bottom, that's uh, the bytecode that's going to be executed, actually. So the important part in this one is the system ID. The system ID is actually what's going to be checked by opcache before executing your cache file. And how it works is that that system ID is actually a global system ID that's available everywhere in your web application. And when the time comes for PHP to execute a script, it's going to take a look in the cache file, load the cache file, and check that system ID. And if that system ID matches the global system ID of the web app, well, that means that it's a valid cache file and it's going to run it. And this is important because if we want to overwrite any, any kind of cache file, we absolutely need to know what the system ID of our victim is. Because if we try to overwrite it and the well, opcache is going to check our uh, malicious cache file, and the system ID won't be the same, so they're just going to drop it and um, well, completely forget about it. So that's important. Now, what's fun about uh, the system ID is that it's actually pretty easy to calculate. Uh, the system ID is 32 bytes. It's a 32 bytes of MD5 hash, and it's actually the PHP version followed by the Zen extension ID and then a couple of data type sizes. And what's also interesting about this is that all these infos are available, available in a PHP info page. So if you manage to leak a PHP info page, uh, you have all the infos that you need to actually calculate the um, system ID yourself. Uh, last thing I want to note here is that um, in the folder structure that I showed earlier, slash temp opcache, that long string that I mentioned earlier, that is the system ID too. And it's the same system ID as what you have in the files, in your cache files, and across the whole web application too. So with all these infos, we have everything we need to already do the exploitation technique. So it's basically five steps. Um, first off, we have to figure out whether your victim is using a 32-bit or a 64-bit operating system. Um, this is important because the bytecode, the malicious cache file that you're going to generate will vary based on whether it's a 32-bit system or 64-bit system that you're using. Uh, next step, uh, we'll have to figure out the system ID of the victim. Um, if you manage to leak the PHP info page, that's great. If you manage to access the uh, opcache folder and see the um, system ID in the file system, that's great too. Um, once we have those, we have to generate a cache file on, the, on a local installation. So at this point, let's say our victim is using a 64-bit Ubuntu machine. You'll want to have your own 64-bit Ubuntu machine too to generate your cache file. And once you have that cache file, uh, that cache file will have our own system ID. It won't have the system ID of the victim. So we'll want to use a system ID that we got earlier from the victim that we calculated ourselves, and use a hex editor and basically overwrite the uh, file cache, the um, cache file in our, our local cache file. Now at that point, the cache file that we have at the end should be fully compliant with uh, the uh, victim server. And uh, at that point, we just have to overwrite the cache file on the victim's machine, and that should give us remote code execution uh, shell or whatever you, you use as a malicious file. So if you guys didn't understand that part, clearly no problem. We're gonna see a demonstration right about now. 
I decided to do a video in this case because we don't have a lot of time right now, so. Good. Okay. So what we have here is a malicious, uh, sorry, a vulnerable website that's vulnerable to unrestricted file upload. And it's vulnerable to a patch reversal too. So I have a file that we're gonna try to upload real quick just to see how it works. And that file gets uploaded in a slash uploads folder. Now the website also has an overrideme.php page. That's the page that we want to override at the end. That, this is gonna be our goal. Uh, we're, we're gonna want to inject some malicious code into that file. And luckily for us, uh, they left a PHP info page. We'll be able to use that later to uh, calculate our system ID. So in a situation like, the, like this, uh, people would normally try to just create a PHP page and try to upload it in the uh, source code file of, of folders. That would be the simplest way to get a shell. So right now we're making a um, quick web shell that we could use. And if we try to upload it, we'll get an error message. So in this case, we can assume that the sysadmin behind it uh, did a good job and actually hardened the source code folders. So with that, we, we, there's nothing, not much that we could do in those source code folders. So let's try true op cache instead. So what we're seeing right now is a, a local installation of op cache. And the uh, op cache that you see, the folder that you see there is where our uh, malicious cache file is gonna be generated. So we recreate our malicious code that we want to execute on the server. Now at this point, we're going to start a local PHP server. And this local server has uh, op cache enabled. So when we're gonna try to send a request to our uh, web shell, like we're doing right now, that's, uh, that's gonna force Opcache to create their own cache file. So if we take a look at the Opcache folder now, we have a cache file that was generated. That's, that's our system ID, and our cache file is right there. So remember, this cache file has our own system ID. It doesn't have the victim system ID at this point. Just to show you real quick what the um, inside of a cache file looks like. We're using a 010 editor in this case. It's a pretty good um, binary uh, editor. Okay. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, you have um, first eight bytes is the magic, uh, the signature of the file, which is opcache. And then the 32 bytes underneath is the system ID. And then you have uh, all of the um, meta infos regarding uh, memory size, string size. So at this point, we're gonna try to calculate the uh, system ID of our victim. We have the PHP info page. So what we're gonna do, uh, we have a tool that uh, scrapes the PHP page and gets the relevant information to calculate the system identifier. So uh, yeah, so we, we give it the URL to our uh, PHP info page, and then it extracts the version, the Zend extension ID, which is uh, the um, version of the, sort of the compiling engine behind PHP, I think. Um, and then the size of the uh, data types, and that gives us at the end a system ID. Now that system ID should technically be the system ID of the victim server. So we're gonna take that. We're going to patch our cache file with the system ID of the victim now. So what we have here, our cache file should now be fully compliant with the victim server. So the last part at this point is just try to upload it. Now we're using patch reversal to um, upload the file, but it could be any other um, upload vulnerabilities that uh, 
like serialization bugs or stuff like that that you could, that you could use. So what we're putting, the, the path that we're putting there is actually the um, folder structure that we showed in the beginning, slash 10, slash opcache and everything. We're getting all the infos that we need from that PHP info page. And when we're done, we're going to upload our file. And like I said, the cache folder has to be writable, so this will work. So if we go to our overwriteme.php page now, we managed to get a web shell. So that's the basics on how web um, opcache override works in this case. Now, the main point that you have to take away from this is that even if we hard code, uh, if, even if we hardened the source code folders, we still manage to overwrite PHP pages anyway. We haven't touched any of the source code at all. So, what else could we do with opcache? Um, well, with, with write access, like I said, we could spawn web shells. Uh, we, we can use the same thing to the base websites if we want. Um, we could also use it to hide malware. Uh, most tools that you're going to see today actually scan the source code files for malware. They, they're going to look for um, uh, keywords uh, like uh, eval or basic 64 decoder, stuff like that. Uh, but not many tools right now actually look into binary files like cache files. So it would actually be a good place for now to hide malware. Um, if we don't have write access uh, and we only have read access, we could still do a lot of damage. Uh, for example, like leaking uh, source code files. So let's say you have a test.php page. Uh, it has only one line of code, which is uh, assigning a password into a variable. Um, if you were to request that page, obviously nothing would be echoed on the screen. There's no, um, there's no content to, uh, that's printed out. But if we were, for example, able to get a php.bin file, uh, we built a opcache disassembler that you could use that's going to try to look at the, at the bytecode and disassemble it and give you a sort of pseudocode-like um, interpretation of the, uh, of the bytecode. So what you're seeing at the bottom right now, you have a, a call to the assign function where it's assigning the string into a variable number one. That gives you a, a good idea of what's, uh, what's running on the original source code. Now, this is uh, pretty trivial in this case because there's, there's nothing interesting there. But, uh, for example, if you manage to leak php.bin files for uh, WordPress configuration files, um, where there's all the keys and database passwords and stuff like that, um, having a php.bin file could be interesting. The other thing, too, is that uh, let's say that they delete those files and they forget to delete the php.bin files, well, you still have access to the source code of what was deleted previously. So that's interesting, too. So regarding prevention and incident response, um, there are a lot of things that you could do to prevent this type of uh, vulnerability from happening. Um, obviously, if, you're, if you have any kind of upload functionalities, uh, I'd suggest using extension whitelists. Um, the goal here is to prevent uh, potentially dangerous extensions from entering your file system. Um, there's also the open base directive that you could use. Open base directive, basically, you use this to specify a list of folders that uh, your PHP functions are allowed to visit. Uh, so for example, if you have um, PHP functions like uh, file get contents and file put contents, if you specify open base directory to uh, the slash temp folder, for example, well, these two functions will only be able to um, manipulate the slash temp folder. Uh, last thing you could do, obviously, do not chmod 777 the opcache folder. Uh, if you do that, you're giving access to pretty much everyone to overwrite cache files. So that's obviously a no-go. Um, and if those things work out, obviously, you could just uh, disable opcache file caching altogether. Now, like I mentioned, the, the problem regarding um, malware is that it could be, it's harder to detect because it's in a binary uh, in, the, in the cache file. So we made a quick tool, uh, Opcache Malware Hunter, that we could use to sort of track down which cache files have been tampered with. So basically how it works is that um, you have your tool, you're going to give it your original source code files. These source code files will be compiled into um, clean, untampered cache files. And then you compare those clean, untampered cache files to the production cache files. And if you see differences there, well, you can flag it as uh, being uh, and you could think that it would, be, would have been manipulated. So um, what you get is a result similar to this here. So on the left side, this is the um, sort of a WordPress uh, file. 
initially. And you can see that it has been manipulated and changed into a web shell on the right side. So, uh, well, that was pretty much it for my talk. Um, all of the tools and the publications that was used for this uh, research are available on the GoSecure GitHub um, website and on GoSecure.net. And if ever you want the slides, they're gonna be available on my GitHub account. Just look for Corbinic. And um, if you wanna reach me, just go through Twitter or LinkedIn and search for Corbinic too, and you'll find me. And if ever there's any questions, uh, feel free to poke me, I'll be there uh, throughout the, uh, oh, well, sure. Huh? Well, um, ideally you'd have a PHP info page, um, but the structure is going to be the same um, everywhere through different installations. If you have the PHP info page, well, you know where the, uh, you could get the initial folder where it's located. And from that, you have the system ID too. So you know that the system ID is gonna be the folder underneath. And after that, it's just a mirror of the original source code. So you just have to put in the document root and then um, the source code where it is, source code file. Was there any other questions? Yes. Memory caching is um, interesting too because what happens is that um, with memory caching, for example, if you start, start your, your server for the first time, memory caching is actually going to check the file cache to see if it already exists for a specific, uh, for a specific number of files and they load the file cached uh, versions into memory. So it, it, even if you disable, there are still a couple of different uh, ways that you can use it. Okay, well, if ever there's any que other questions, just feel free to poke me throughout the event. Thank you.